This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. This project, uh, the story of the start of this project is really the story um, of what's going on with environmental communication right now. Because as some of you may, may or may not know, com environmental communication has um, been kind of a latent subfield within communication, really has just started to receive some traction and some visibility. There's a new journal that's come out in the last couple of years, the Journal of Environmental Communication. And uh, that just recently we were talking about how there's a couple of faculty positions now that are explicitly about environmental communication. So when um, initially, uh, there was a, a call for papers um, that, uh, I, that came across my desk that said um, it was looking for uh, hard science research on energy efficiency. And I thought, hmm, well, I don't really do that, but um, it looks like they have a pool of money. Um, uh, maybe I'll see if they maybe are thinking about some sort of outreach for uh, all this innovation and technology that they're, they're developing. So I sent them an email and filled, they just wanted a little two-page proposal. I filled out, I did the two-page proposal and they wrote back and said, great, we love your idea, uh, we forgot, we forgot about that. Uh, you know, so that's, that's part of what I mean about like environmental communication being this, it's almost an afterthought in the, in the race toward efficiency and, and all the, um, the, the debates around, around how we're going to solve the problems of climate change often get reduced to these technical solutions, right? So, um, so, so they said, okay, we, want, we like this. So they said, so then I talked to Laura. I said, Laura, I, I, we're gonna, I'm going to pursue this grant. She said, well, uh, you're going to make some PSAs. So I said, yeah. She said, well, how are you going to evaluate them? I said, oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. You know I, I know about video production. Like, we're, we're going to make some cool videos. So, so I went back to the grant people and, and I said, well, how about if you double it and then add another, add a, give us even more money to do some evaluation? They said, even better. So, uh, so, so um, and again, uh, you know, this was a state of Florida money um, trying to uh, really jumpstart uh, both the technology sector around uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, but then also um, coming to it a little bit late, but really as they've thought more about it, realizing the importance of, of a communication campaign and, and, and public information to, to change attitudes and behaviors. So part of what we're doing here is we're trying to, this team, I brought together faculty from the film school, from uh, social sciences, from communication, and the school of theater, to form a team that brought together social scientists and artists, okay, and and oftentimes we all work in our departments, right, and and, and you all you know take different classes in different departments, and the topics don't always overlap, and, and we don't always speak the same language. So um, part of what we're going to talk about is is the challenge of working uh, across disciplines and bringing together an interdisciplinary team. Um, uh, our goal has been to create scalable media. Um, I started uh, a couple of years before this a little pilot project on a campus sustainability initiative where the students helped me make some, some uh, kind of lo-fi PSAs that were very much aimed at students about recycling and things like that on campus. And, um, and so we're interested in, in really everything from the local level right here on campus on up through your, your local city, county, state, and, and national uh, initiatives. Um, and so uh, our project then is a two-year grant uh, funded by the Florida Energy Systems Consortium. Um, uh, you know, I talked a little bit about our, our process here. Um, and the idea is to, to create data-driven media, right? So that we, we create media products, we then test the media products, and we revise those media products based on the, the results of the testing. So, so we get a sense of uh, are, are we, are things working? Are, is, it, is our message getting through? Do, are the audiences responding? Which audiences are responding, right? As, as you know, Florida has a big retirement community, they're going to uh, respond to calls for efficiency different, differently than a, a university audience or uh, maybe more urban uh, working professionals. So um, 
So we're working with this model here to try and think about, okay, what's a process within, the, within a given university, and we're trying to develop a bit of a model that can be replicated to, uh, and brought to other universities and that you here at US, uh, uh, UCSB can follow, where because you have very strong production facilities, you have very strong social science researchers, you have a lot of great ideas, so um, bring these people together, do the work, um, and, and, and be able to, you're kind of your own real-time uh, production studio with a research arm, and, and you can, uh, by leveraging the, the material assets of cameras and editing systems and with the intellectual assets of creativity and, and the social science skills, um, create some very quick turnaround, create, create, come up with clever ideas, and see if those ideas are effective or not, and if they're not, change them. And, and so you're not, you're, not, you're not seeking, you're not hiring outside people, big consultants or professionals or, or Hollywood names. Instead, you're working very much with local resources, local, local materials. Um, uh, so, and we're also interested in the different channels that, that you deliver this media. Although we're, we shot all of our pieces in high definition, uh, clearly, you know, we're all looking at lots of different size screens from the very small ones on our phones to uh, the giant ones in our, in our homes or, or in, in movie theaters. So, um, scalable media that can be presented across a variety of formats. Um, and, and that, again, this, this idea of, of relatively affordable, low-cost production uh, approach to production. Andy got this wonderful uh, team together of these fantastic, creative, funky people, and then I warmed my way onto that team um, to represent the much less interesting, fun, and creative uh, part of this team. And I uh, felt like my task was to help them figure out what needed to be said to encourage people to engage in energy conservation behaviors and to figure out if what we thought ought to be said uh, in needed to be said that in that way. And so, um, and I had a wonderful research assistant uh, who was a doctoral student, her name's Lu Jia. So when I talk about we, it's Jia and I. So we scoured uh, existing literature on public communication campaigns, including uh, Dr. Rice's lovely book, um, oh, okay. environment and energy campaigns in particular, and came up with kind of this uh, probably horrifyingly long list of things for the creative team to consider. The first one uh, was kind of the, the humbling. So let's start out um, by realizing that many of these types of campaigns end up, end up not changing very much at all if we look at uh, public communication campaigns for a lot of good reasons. Um, one of those is that messages alone tend to have very little impact. And in communication, we don't like to hear that because we get excited about messages. But in the end, you need a lot more to get the job done. So let's, let's realize um, uh, we need a lot of other things here, but we'll work on the messages. That's great. The other thing to keep in mind is that often people who are interested in the environment or who think something like energy conservation is a great thing to do, so they have a positive attitude toward this. Um, don't conserve energy or don't engage in kind of pro-environmental behavior. So the attitudes don't match up with the behavior. Again, for a lot of good reasons. I'll talk about some of those in a minute. The other thing we really needed to consider was that people who don't care about the environment or who don't want to conserve energy, we're going to have a very difficult time convincing them to change their minds. Existing attitudes are very resilient. Existing behaviors, like using all the energy that you want to, that's a very resilient behavior also. So let's keep in mind that we have a very difficult task here with these little 30-second messages. Now, when we look at this literature on environmental and uh, energy conservation behaviors, there are several factors that um, influence whether or not you're going to engage in these energy conservation behaviors. One big factor is the values that each of us brings to this context. Environmentalism is a value. Um, being frugal is a value, liking to save money. Um, not wanting people to tell you what to do, feeling auto autonomous, that's a value. And those values are going to drive our attitudes toward this issue, and, and they can often do so very strongly. So we need to think about that. We also have a problem with energy, and this may seem foreign to you guys in California, who I know you sometimes uh, 
energy problems are very clear to you, as I understand when I read the news. But throughout uh, the rest of the country, uh, many people perceive a very low risk of running out of energy or you know, perceive a very low risk of any kind of energy shortage. And also, many people in this country uh, are not um, convinced that climate change is a risk. And this is made worse, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, with um, stories that get run in the news and people thinking that scientists agree less about climate change than they actually do. So the level of risk is, is somewhat low in this context, and that can be a problem. Another big issue that comes up is problems of knowledge. So when we talk about energy conservation, people often do visible things, like turn the lights off or adjust the thermostat to where um, they've been told it ought to be. So they do things they can see and they overestimate how effective these behaviors are in reducing energy use. Conversely, um, they don't do less visible things like making sure there's enough attic insulation in their homes, and they <coughs> underestimate how effective that type of behavior is. They also um, don't know how to do what's most effective in a lot of cases. They don't know, um, caulking and weather stripping around your windows and doors is very effective, but when we look at national survey data, people will say, I just, I don't know how to do that. That seems too complex. And I want to back up one second on knowledge, too. One thing we found out when we surveyed people in the South is, and particularly in Florida, they felt like attic insulation was only important if you needed to run the heat. And they didn't realize that attic insulation actually reduces the amount of air conditioning you have to use. So it's simple things like this. When you look at the information that's out there, um, that's put out by power companies or whomever, it's also often very confusing. So we have huge knowledge problems. Efficacy is another problem. We often uh, perceive that we can't do what's most effective. I was just talking about that with caulking and weather stripping. Or sometimes we don't believe these actions that are recommended to us will actually help. If you look at the, um, and I know some of you are studying um, health communication or health campaigns, and we often talk about uh, benefits and barriers. Common barriers to energy conservation are it'll cost me money to put in this insulation, it will cost me money to buy an energy efficient car, um, it will take me time to do this stuff, it's inconvenient, so there's a lot of stuff getting in the way. The uh, other problem is that benefits or rewards are often kind of invisible or delayed. So if you make all these changes, you guys don't have houses yet, but when you do, um, make all these changes in order to um, protect the planet, and you put the insulation in, you caulk and weather strip your doors, the planet doesn't get healed and then thank you tomorrow. <laughs> uh, you're not probably going to see the benefits of that. You might see a lower electric bill, but in many cases, it's not going to be a huge different difference. And so these benefits are delayed or sometimes invisible. That's a problem when you're trying to promise people rewards for making these changes. And one of the changes is you're asking people, in some cases, to be a little bit less comfortable. Let me go back up and talk about norms. There's been some interesting work um, lately, and a lot of it's been uh, out here in the West, looking at uh, perceptions of um, if others around us are engaging in these behaviors. You know when you go to a hotel and there's a little sign in the bathroom that says, would you help us protect the environment by reusing your towels um, and rather than leaving them on the floor because then we don't have to wash them as much? Um, there's a guy who did a study and they, um, you know, he had reason to believe that that wasn't a very effective persuasion strategy. So they tried um, using what we would call a norms approach and instead, they changed, well, not instead, half the people in the hotel got the protect the environment sign, half of the people got, most guests who have stayed in this room have reused their towels. The latter strategy was wildly more successful than the protect the environment. And this is invoking a social norm. People like you, people around you are doing this, and there's a little bit of a suggestion there, too, that you ought to do it, right? <laughs> Um, another example, um, they went out into, they cooperated with a local power company and went out into the neighborhoods and put little door, uh, doorknob signs on people's houses. And they had four different messages that they were varying. One was, you know, start uh, conserving energy, you'll save money. The other was, start conserving energy, it'll help the environment. 
the other was protect future generations, conserve energy, and the last one was most of your neighbors are already taking steps to conserve energy. And again, that was the one that was most successful. So uh, we were kind of intrigued by this. I wanted us to consider, you know, kind of prompting these considerations of norms. And again, there's good precedent for doing this in the health literature. I don't know if you guys have studied the theory of planned behavior. Norms is a big component of that. Not they can find it in a book. Uh, finally, one thing we also had to realize uh, was that sometimes in order to get good behavior change, you just have to get a policy change. You have to change policy. You have to require people to do things, and we didn't really have the power to do that. So again, let's think about the limitations. So this is a huge horrifying list I gave. The creative team took about 45 minutes. Their eyes are glazing over. Um, <laughs> so to summarize, um, in the end, what we kind of asked them to really focus on, first of all, consider existing attitudes toward the environment, toward energy conservation. Um, there are a lot of good reasons to conserve energy. Not everyone thinks that protecting the environment is one of them. So realize that, remind people who do think it's good to do it for the environment. That's fine. Remind them of that. Offer other people a different motivation. Maybe you don't care about the environment, but maybe you care about these other reasons. Um, so offer them one that's consistent uh, with their values or their perspectives. So uh, we would call this matching the message to um, the audience worldview or the audience's attitude function or the audience frame, depending on what part of the discipline you come from. Think about that. The other thing is to help people do what needs to be done. Show them, um, help them with these concerns about efficacy. So in these PSAs, have people modeling effective behaviors, overcoming obstacles, um, kind of to save energy, you should do this. Look, it's really easy and it's really effective and here's how to do it. That would be best case scenario. And finally, uh, consider um, addressing this, this, uh, these perceptions of norms. So whenever you can, demonstrate how esteemed proximal others are conserving energy. So that's that you know, very small task that we gave to the creative team. And then we got out of the way for a few months, right? We went away and we let the creative team work their magic. And Andy's going to show you uh, what, what they came up with. Okay, so uh, among the team, there were, there were a variety of responses to, to uh, the, the work and the literature. Um, some of us tried to integrate this, so, so we did a series of brainstorming. Well, we started by going online and looking at as many online environmental PSAs as we could find and sharing those. We set up a, a Blackboard site. I don't know if you use that software here, but, you know, so big resource. You know, looked at lots of ideas, looked at what people were doing, kind of said, okay, and then thought about well, what, you know, went off and people then came back with, I think everybody had to bring, you know, five to seven ideas, and then from those ideas we whittled them down. And, um, and so it was a, a bit of a dialogue back and forth, trying to keep uh, the, the points that Laura had, had raised in mind as we were working through our creative ideas. Um, and so I'm going to uh, show a series of what we came up with here. And, um, and in some cases, uh, those ideas were front and center. In other cases, they, they got lost um, uh, along the way. Some humor, but but then and then the the recognizing the the financial the self uh, self reward element. Um. Okay, George, that's it. Have a good night. Phew, this was a slow day. Let's go plug in and see how our circuits are working. You can serenade me with the Bee Gees, just like you did in the old days. Um, is this the Museum of Obsolete Technologies? I, I've just been sent here. What? You're a light bulb. You haven't outlived your useful life. I'm afraid I have. 
Those new compact fluorescents live 10 times longer than me and use only one-fourth the energy. They're one of the easiest ways to protect the environment. My days are dimming. My filament's fading. Now, now. You had a good long life. What's it been? Almost 150 years? Why, I was just a teenager when the DVD came along. And I barely lived to see the birth of disco. Life moves on, son. It's time to see things in a new light. <laughs> Bob, looks like you got a penguin problem. Yeah, every summer they nest at my windows and doors. I had a terrible penguin infestation problem a couple of years ago. Ooh. Really? What'd you do to get rid of them? Penguins love cool air leaking out between your windows and your doors. Makes them feel like they're at home. You need an energy audit. What's an energy audit? Well, you call your power company. They send out an expert. They identify all of the leaks around your windows and doors. It's free and it'll save you money. Free and it'll save me money? I'm calling today. With no more cold air leaking, those penguins are gonna move right on out of here. No more penguins clogging up my windows and doors. Solve your penguin problem. Help secure America's energy independence. Get an energy audit today. Okay, so we've seen uh, the, the money, the money reinforcement, the save the environment reinforcement, and, and this was, um, what did you just say? What? Oh, energy independence. Right, right. So um, for the U.S. And then um, now in this next one, uh, we had one of our team members was, uh, was a dramatist and wanted to write a, a, a sitcom, essentially. Um, and so their, their script, you know, what should have been a two-page script started as a ten-page script. And little by little, we, we whittled it down. But um, I think you'll see um, the uh, kind of the, the density of... of trying to get a short message across. Lights left on? Not cool. All cords all plugged? Very nice. Let's go check on Dad. Five bucks as he's wearing Mom's apron. Hey, buddy. Dad not using dishwasher? Excellent. Mom and Sis, some classic mother daughter bonding. There they are, not using the dryer. Saves cash and reduces our carbon footprint. Awesome. 78 degrees, great. It's here. Dad, it's here. Don't open it yet. It's here. Utility bill. Wow. I think we saved enough money to buy the... Bikes! Bikes. Let's do it. Green your routine. It's actually pretty fun. Those are a sample of, of what we came up with, and um, and then uh, we, we kind of we went back to Laura and the, and the research team, and and came up with a series of different endings. You, you saw you know, the variety of, of points we were touching on where we were where we realized okay norms are important. Uh, this idea of personal savings is is important. Uh, the literature has shown us uh, this idea of, of uh, kind of patriotism, country. Um, and so, so coming up with these different uh, motivations, we then, we then altered the endings of, of each of these pieces to, to then be able to test 
uh, which ending and which, which kind of dominant little takeaway message uh, was the most effective. So that, that began then our, our testing process, um, uh, our message testing, so, um, which Laura will, will describe. This. So it's at this point when um, uh, John and I saw the, the public service announcements that were created that I think this quote from a recent uh, journal article where they were testing the effectiveness of anti-drug PSAs, uh, I felt like this was really appropriate. So creating, uh, designing messages that are explicit in their intent and capable of attracting attention, yet compatible with the audience's sensibilities and tailored to what the audience or tailored to what their targets are willing to consider, these are rarely simple tasks. And this is becoming quite clear. Uh, we looked at these PSAs and I thought they were beautiful and that they did a nice job of depicting some good energy uh, Con conservation behaviors, but in many cases, I felt like they weren't explicit enough in terms of motivation, um, or off, you know, weren't offering um, these various uh, good motivations for conserving energy. And the ones that Andy showed you um, actually uh, came after we looked at them and came back and asked to uh, ask the team to take each PSA and create several alternate endings or frames or, you know, put these kind of appeals in wherever they could. The social norms frame, I think um, the penguin problem initially was the only one that really uh, addressed social norms and you, you haven't seen that frame yet. Um, I think later uh, on the back end we were actually looking at some of the rhetoric uh, or the discourse that was surfacing about energy issues and climate change. Uh, in particular, and thought about this energy independence frame, which would seem to match up with a value of patriotism, and that's a different value than environmentalism, and that seemed to be a way to maybe reach another uh, sub uh, segment of the audience. Um, clearly, you know, the environmental frame is one that we want to test and compare how effective that frame is to the other ones. Um, I had reason to believe that that was going to be a particularly ineffective frame, but we definitely needed to look at that. And the other um, thing we wanted to look at, the uh, persuasion literature, there's um, an idea called um, functional matching, I mentioned it earlier, but also a kind of a multifunction message, and some of the environmental liter literature talks about this too. Look at all the motivations that are out there create one message for each, and then go back in and try to create one message that mentions them all. And the literature suggests that if you do that, people will just key into or pay attention to the frame that makes the most sense to them and kind of ignore all the other stuff. If that works, that's great for public, for public service announcements because I don't know how much you guys know about distribution, but you often don't have control over who sees a public service announcement. You send it out to television stations, they play it at three o'clock in the morning, uh, if you're lucky, if they play it at all. Um, you don't get to kind of micro-target the distribution of this message. So if this multi-appeal would work, that would be great. No more penguins clogging up my windows and doors. Solve your penguin problem. Save energy. Save money. Get an energy audit today. Those new compact fluorescents live 10 times longer than me and use only one-fourth the energy. They save consumers money, they're better for the environment, and everyone's using them to secure our energy independence. My days are dimming. <laughs> My this museum PSA was the only one that really lent itself to the multi-frame approach. Um, when you're adding them on to the end, it seemed like it would go on and on too much. So we, um, in the end, made multiple versions of the ELF, uh, PSA, the Penguin Problem PSA, and the museum. Uh, we really couldn't deal with the little family PSA. We just couldn't figure out how to, how to modify that one. Um, we also really couldn't modify the Imagine Green one. Um, that was pretty clearly an environmental frame, and, and there was supposed to be a script, but this lovely creative guy actually hadn't written it yet by the time we needed to test these. Uh, but we were interested in this because it, it was so beautiful. Um, also, Andy had submitted these to um, the Broadcast Education Association video, film and video con contest, and Imagine Green won a, a big, beautiful award. Yeah, the best PSA. Best PSA. The other ones didn't win anything, and 
You should tell the comment well, well, about right. the, the other ones. The, 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 peng, the penguin and elf didn't didn't even get accepted into the festival. And the, one of the comments on the penguin was, uh, "Those types of penguins don't nest together." Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we need to be more biologically accurate in the future. And and got CGI. <laughs> right, 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 right. They they were like they, they didn't like the fact that we used stuffed animals. They wanted us to use uh, graphic. Effects. They they weren't picking up on the intentional kitsch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we just kind of thought, let's, let's see which of these really seem to be, um, these different narratives seem to resonate best with the audience. So we left Imagine Green in, just said this is an example of an environmentally framed message, and, and let's just really see. Because again, I thought Imagine Green is stunningly beautiful, but if you look at the, the literature, very unlikely to be effective. So, you know, you have to put your, your data where your mouth is, and so that's what we tried to do. So when we went to test, do this message testing, again, we were kind of looking at um, a couple, we can only look at a couple of um, kind of theoretical approaches here. One was this matched message. Again, the literature suggests when you match these uh, message appeals to audience uh, uh, values and, and worldviews, that audience members will perceive that message as having a higher quality, and they will subsequently pay more attention to it, process it more carefully, and maybe remember it better. So that seemed like a good thing. Um, the other thing I was really concerned about, again, just given all the discourse about energy and climate um, and environmental, um, environmental issues, was the idea of psychological reactants. And psychological reactance occurs when we perceive that um, an important freedom is being threatened. And this can be a really kind of minimal freedom, like just the freedom to have a given opinion towards something or the freedom to use all the energy that you want to use. When we feel like we're being threatened, we experience reactants, which um, recently we've come to understand as anger, coupled with uh, negative thoughts about the message and sometimes the message source. When we experience reactants, we tend to reject that message, reject that PSA, reject that ad, reject that political speech. And not only uh, are we unlikely to do what that message is suggesting that we do, but in many cases, we immediately go out and do the opposite. Um, so in this case, if we're creating messages that are um, instigating reactants among our audience, we're not only not helping ourselves, we're potentially hurting ourselves. And this comes up a lot uh, when you look at these anti-drug PSAs, and that's where a lot of this, um, uh, these findings have come from. So I wanted to look at uh, psychological reactants to these messages. And in the course of doing this, uh, in the course of our testing, uh, the Super Bowl came around. And there was an ad that ran during the Super Bowl for okay. Audi. Okay, so it's 3708. Okay. Uh, oh, no, you're good. This was an ad for Audi that ran. For, uh, I just want to give you just a little uh, more idea about reactants. Paper plastic. Plastic. That's the magic word. What? Green police. <laughs> You picked the wrong day to mess with the ecosystem, Plastic Boy. Battery! Battery. Let's go. Take the house. Come on. Put the rind down. Sure. That's a compost inversion. Oh, oh. Did you install these bulbs? Oh. Tragedy strikes tonight where a man has just been arrested for possession of an incandescent light bulb. What do you guys think about plastic bottles now? The water setting is at 105. Yeah. You got a TDI here? Clean diesel. You're good to go, sir. Good afternoon, officers. Back to those styrofoam cups you're drinking from? Yeah. Tell me, please step out of the car and put them on the hood. <laughs> so, um, and thankfully, uh, my colleague who works next door said, oh, have you heard about all people pushing back against this Audi ad? And I said, no, I haven't. Um, so I went to YouTube and, and copied all the little comments about the ad, and I was looking for examples of reactants. And playing the part of the reacting YouTuber is Andy Opel. Saving the planet is not what environmentalism is all about. Saving the planet is just the excuse. <laughs> Controlling other people's lives and redistributing global wealth is the true goal. <laughs> Or, if you think this level of eco-obsession is okay, you'll change your mind when they get in your personal space and you can't just laugh and walk away because they'll be carrying you away. 
So uh, these are these are typical of YouTube. If you look on the YouTube, you know they go on and on, right? Really hostile, really angry um, at this ad, taking it very literally. Like this is th these are the eco green police, and they're coming for me. And <laughs> and you. Uh, so I thought, okay, yeah, this is what we don't want. This is what we don't want. So what we did, we took these uh, messages and tested them. Uh, we created an online experiment. Uh, because we only had the money for 10 minutes of people's time, that's how much time the experiment took. Uh, people who participated were randomly assigned to see one of the resulting 14 PSAs and versions that, uh, versions that we created. Um, and then they watched the PSA, then we asked them just generally um, attitude toward the ad, the folks who study that or just liking of the PSA. Uh, we asked them questions relating to psychological reaction, uh, reactants, uh, their perceptions of social norms. Uh, we had a behavioral measure where they were um, asked if they would like to receive more information about any of the energy saving behaviors that were modeled in the PSA and they could just click yes right now or send me stuff later. And we also asked them uh, for their kind of existing values or attitudes or worldviews that should come into play when they respond to these messages. So we had questions about environmental values, questions about patriotism. This was an, how much do you identify with being American or with Americans? And questions about kind of frugality being the main reason, saving money uh, for conserving energy. Uh, in the end, 340 uh, non-college students uh, participated in this, and they were recruited by Knowledge Networks, which does a, a really nice job of recruiting uh, people through random digit dialing and address lists across the country. Um, when I looked at these PSAs, uh, we had thought about testing them nation nationally, but when I looked at them, I kind of noticed a southern climate bias in the depictions, and so decided to only test them in the south where people have yards that look like that and where they use and worry about air conditioning and so might have a penguin problem. Uh, you can see that the mean age of our participants uh, was 49, uh, roughly equal male and female, and most of them had a detached, detached single home, which means most of them probably knew what they were spending on energy and had the ability to make some changes. So that's important. Now, before we talk about how effective matched messages were, I do want to say um, across all four of those narratives, Elf, Penguin, Museum, and Imagine Green, they were all equally liked by participants for the most part. Um, also, these basic frames across all participants were for the most part equally effective, although um, the money, uh, the saving money frame uh, was a little bit more effective than the environmental frame. Um, as, as we might have been concerned about. So before I give you the data on how well matching the message to the audience perspective worked, I want to give you an example of what would count as a matched message in this analysis. So if you scored high on our um, little patriotism scale and you saw a message that was framed in terms of energy independence, that would count as a matched message. If you scored high on patriotism and saw any of these other frames, that would count as a non-matched message. And the same would apply um, for people higher in environmentalism and high um, in interest in saving money. So overall, uh, a matched message was evaluated more favorably than a non-matched message. Um, matched messages were better liked. People who saw a matched message exhibited less reactance. Um, there was really no difference on that behavioral measure, though. And, you know, it wasn't a great behavioral measure, but it's kind of all we could come up with uh, in the course of an online experiment. So, you know, this isn't rocket science, but I think it's important because if you look at the first PSAs that this team created, um, they're in Tallahassee. Tallahassee, um, for a long time, was the only um, blue county in the state of Florida. These, you know, are mostly environmentalists working on this message, so it makes sense to frame these messages environmentally, and that's most of what came out of that first round of PSAs. And it's just really important for us to remember that that's not going to be a convincing motivation for a lot of the audience, and this is just the extra evidence sometimes you need to help people um, realize that when they're creating the messages. Now, um, with that in mind, I looked at um, what happens when you don't provide 
a value consistent message uh, to the group that I considered uh, that would be most reactive to this, and that was those who would say, I am not an environmentalist. So they had a low score in that environmentalism scale. And indeed, non-matched messages for these folks were liked less, um, instigated more reactants, and fewer requests for more information. So it was really um, this environmentally framed message when a person who is not concerned about the environment saw it, they reacted quite negatively to it. Conversely, non-matched messages were not a problem for people at the low end of the patriotism scale, for example. They didn't seem to mind that frame, responded to it just as, you know, just as positively or even just as negatively as, as um, other frames. And it didn't seem to be a problem for uh, folks who were concerned about saving money. Those people were open to other appeals just as much as a money-saving appeal. So really the only problem uh, was the people who didn't consider themselves environmentalists when you showed them the, an environmentally framed message. They just did not like it. All right, the multi-frame message uh, for this analysis, again, because these uh, low environmentals were shown to be the problem, we just kind of focused the analysis among them and compared, all right, if we show you that message that includes an environmental appeal but also includes all these other appeals, is that better than showing you an environmentally framed message? Um, and they rated that equ you know, equivalently. Um, there was this uh, very weak finding that um, they did request more information when they saw the multi-framed message than when they saw the environmentally framed message. Um, something really important here though, uh, at this point we've whittled our little sample down to just comparing a few cases and we really need more participants to really test uh, this question very well. But it looks like there is something interesting going on uh, with a multi-framed message and that you are going to be better off with that than just the environmental message. Maybe not hugely, but every little bit counts. Now, the other thing I mentioned that we were interested in was kind of cueing these perceptions of social norms. So we did a couple of analyses um, looking at that. And before I give you the results, I want to show you how we framed norms across three of these narratives. So for the penguin narrative, it's don't be the last one on your block to get an energy audit. For elf, it's your neighbors aren't waiting for the elf to conserve energy, neither should you. And for the museum, uh, it was just everyone is using them. And of course, uh, the light bulb was talking about compact fluorescent bulbs. What we found was that we did not do a very good job of influencing perceptions of social norms. So people who saw a message uh, with the norms frame did not perceive that more people were doing this behavior than people who saw any of the other message frames. The norms frame did not really affect perceptions of norms. So we need to go back to the drawing board on that one. And I, I think that's going to be difficult. Um, oh, sorry, got ahead of myself. Here's how we measured uh, perceptions, this is fine, how we measured perceptions of norms. And those of you who have studied norms, we looked at two different kinds. Descriptive norms, uh, it's basically um, your perception of roughly the percentage of people around you, um, what percentage of them are engaging in this behavior. Subjective is, you know, the people that I care about, um, do they want me to engage in this behavior? So we looked at perceptions of both types of norms. And again, um, neither of those uh, were particularly affected by seeing a norms framed message. There was a little bit of a difference uh, between the penguin frame and the elf frame on perceptions of subjective norms, but it wasn't a huge difference. Um, one other thing that was kind of interesting though, I mentioned that um, the first step in psychological reactance is feeling threatened. And there was a slight um, association uh, between seeing a, a norms frame message and feeling threatened as compared to if you saw the money saving frame. So this suggests that um, you, there's the potential to set off reactants when you use a norms frame message. Um, what I did then was just to look at the role, that's fine, um, look at the role of perceived norms. 
and look at the relationship between that and some of our other variables. So um, the norms that we're looking at here are the perceptions of norms that these folks had coming into this study. They weren't influenced by what we were showing them, um, but it's still, we're still interested in the perceptions of norms in the process. So to the extent that you perceived um, greater social norms, you experienced less reactants. That's perceptions. Um, so that could be a good thing, but we don't know uh, the direction of the relationship between those two variables. So that's something that's really important to consider. The other thing that we found was that greater perceptions of social norms were associated with requesting more information. So the more you thought people around you that you were concerned about were doing this, the more likely you were to, to request more information about these behaviors. And in fact, uh, social norms was the only variable in our study that was related to the behavior. Nothing else was related to behavior. So, you know, it looks like norms are important here. Um, the problem that we have is how to um, influence people's perceptions of norms with these messages. Uh, which leads to our conclusions, and the number one conclusion I have is we need to figure out how to more effectively um, communicate social norms, and maybe we can talk about that. Um, and also, because of that relationship between threat, it seems like, great, if you can do this without irritating people, then they're more likely to do what you want them to do. But if you irritate them, then they're less likely to do what you want to do. So I think playing around with norms could be really effective, or it could be really um, detrimental. So we surely need more research. Um, the other thing uh, that we take away from this is, again, concerns about framing these messages from an environmental perspective. Um, it seems like that can be dangerous territory too. The people who are already concerned about the environment, um, they tend to know that energy conservation will help that. So you, you maybe are kind of preaching to the choir with those messages anyway, and you run the risk of turning some other people off. So maybe the environmental frame uh, is the last thing you want to use in these messages. What you may be better off doing, the environmentals want to do this, but the data shows that they just need some more information about what's most effective and how to do it and how can I get some financial help. So when you want to address them, help them do it. You don't need to remind them about the environmental issues. Other people, you can give them alternate reasons for doing these uh, behaviors. And um, there's also some work being done that's asking if, wow, what if we thought about talking to people about the health issues associated with energy and environmental behaviors? And there's a, there's a definite direct link, and maybe that kind of takes all the controversy out of it, and maybe that's the most effective frame. And we clearly haven't created any messages about that, but I would like to look at that as well. And um, do you want to show your, your cautionary uh, tale? Yeah, yeah, I, mean, well, it's, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, so this, uh, just a little bit of the, the struggle of, of kind of blending the, the art with the science, right, and trying to, to actually execute pieces. Uh, and those of you that have done some production right know the, the trials and tribulations of casting and getting your set together in your locations and getting good quality images and sound and putting the whole package together, right? So you got all these technical hurdles that, that, that you, you struggle with and then to, so, so you know, getting the, the thought of the, the thinking of the creative team li lined up with, with kind of the, the research is, it was a bit of a trick and a bit of a challenge with this, with this pro process. But, but what I want to show you is, is an example of how, um, how important it is to do this, right? How important it is to, to include the research component because what, what I want to show you is a piece that a very high dollar, high production value, clearly large, uh, large dollar expensive ad that was released a couple of weeks ago by the 1010 campaign, which is a UK climate change group. And uh, for those of you that are a little squeamish, I'm just going to play the first part. It's, uh, it's, yes. it's a little bit upsetting. Um, and uh, here, I'll get, in terms of the. Uh, oh. Hold on, that's all. So, uh, Okay, so it's a, called the No Pressure Video. Uh, it was written by Richard Curtis, who, who wrote uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral, and it features Julian Anderson, Peter Cruch, and Ledley King. Right, so, so you know, well-known people, uh, clearly a lot of money, a lot of, a lot of uh, 
um, high profile energy went into this, right? But they didn't have a research component. Um, and, th and this is what they came up with. Right, kids, just before you go, there's a brilliant idea in the air that I'd like to run by you. Now, it's called 1010. The idea is everyone starts cutting their carbon emissions by 10%, thus keeping the planet safe for everyone, eventually. Now, this hasn't got to be a huge thing, but I would love it if you and your families would think about doing something. What sort of thing, miss? Well, like getting your dad to insulate the loft or taking your next holiday by train instead of flying, or buying energy-saving light bulbs. We're thinking of using our car less. I'm going to cycle to school. That's fantastic, Jemima. Now, no pressure at all, but it'd be great to get a sense of how many of you might do this, just a rough percentage. That's fantastic. And those not? Philip and Tracy. That's fine, that's absolutely fine. Your own choice. Okay, class, thank you so much for today, and I will see you all tomorrow. Oh, just before you go, I just need to press this little button here. Now, everybody, please remember to read chapters five and six on volcanoes and glaciation. Except for Philip and Tracy, of course. Right, just want to check on that 1010 thing. Um, had some. Okay, so it goes through uh, three more scenarios. Um, <laughs> and you're be checking us on the squeamish part. <laughs> No, that, that was it. That was it. <laughs> well, well they, 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 they're increasingly sort of graphic. Uh, um, uh, uh, okay, so again, here's the responses. Here's an example of the response online. Ironically, this is actually quite accurate. The global elite will use such things as your noncompliance to carbon propaganda like this as a justified reason for, reason for extermination. No mention of science yet again, just propaganda on propaganda. Welcome to your fascist controlled future. No pressure. Um, and one more uh, typical reaction. These people are crazy, and I cannot wait to mash the gas on my black smoke spewing Dodge turbo diesel in the AM. So, Reactants. You know, <laughs> the exact opposite reaction of what you want, right? And, 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 and portrays, and if you, on and on, this, and, and the, the, the video's been posted, they, they tried to take it down because it caused so, such a strong reaction, but of course it's in the digital world, so it keeps getting reposted, it's on YouTube and multiple sites, and the, 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 the level of vehemence said about, this is, this is the left, and whenever the left gets in control, the bodies start piling up, was another quote, and it just, you know, really, so it's, it's doing far more damage to, to the agenda that it's trying to promote, right, in terms of awareness of climate change, than so, so that's, when I say a cautionary tale, I think it's, you know, the, the kind of thing we're talking about where bringing a research component to your production is, is really critically important, or else even, even the best, the highest quality people who do very good work uh, fall into the pitfalls of, um, of, of thinking something might be funny or clever and, uh, and actually um, moving all the efforts backwards a couple of steps. So. Yeah, and I think the, the last challenge that we haven't, um, really begun to address too much with this is the challenge of all uh, communication campaigns that rely on public service announcements, and that's distribution. Um, if messages are going to work, uh, people have to be exposed to those messages repeatedly, and we're trying to think about creative ways to get these messages out without a lot of money. Andy um, had a great idea to show them, we have a little football program at uh, Florida State, and um, just a small stadium that one or two people come to every now and then with a little screen at the end of the field. Um, there's a lot going on on that screen, and we were wanting to do some initial testing of the message and thought, wow, if we could get our PSAs on these jumbotrons around the state of Florida where they just like football just a little bit, that's a lot of exposure. That'd be cool. And then we can survey people as they leave the game and see how they respond. And there's Great. basketball jumbotrons, basketball, right. and there's baseball jumbotrons. You start to play it out across the university system in a big system like California, a big system like Florida. You, those are, that's a relatively easy captive audience to reach uh, at, at basically zero cost if you can get the athletics departments to buy in. That's the big if. Which you can't. <laughs> well, so. least, uh, we initially couldn't because it turns out that the screen time is sold to commercial interests uh, during the football game at very you know, high dollar rates. So they let us play our piece before kickoff 
uh, about 30 minutes before kickoff. Um. So not so great, even though our work was being funded by the state of Florida. Uh, so we have some issues there, um, but I think uh, we'll stop there and, and open it up to questions, and thank you for your attention. What's one lesson you from the production arm learned about the value of research, and what's one lesson you from the research arm learned about the value of production? Well, I, I think anytime you're doing production, you, you think about your audience, but I think this really helped us think about our audience in a more sophisticated way. And, and to really, and, and when you begin to distill some of these core concepts, uh, such as norms or uh, you know a nationalist appeal, that kind of a patriotism appeal, then that that, that gives you something to work with. And it, you know, all for for me as a you know creative person, um, constraints are can be helpful, right? It helps to you know narrow what you're trying to do and, and work work within those constraints. So so I think um, having having those very clear uh, themes that 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 we needed to work within and and knowing that they were coming out of the literature uh, is, is, is a really valuable lesson and, and I think now when we go through our next iteration we'll, we'll be able to integrate those I, I think you know a lot more effectively. Yeah. Um, I think what I learned was that I should have sat in on those creative meetings. Um, I felt uh, I was the fish out of water. I felt like um, the, uh, the rain on the parade person with, with all my science and so I kind of can you think about this? Here's the science. Here's, thank you very much. You guys go have fun. And, and I, but no, no, no. I, we're thinking about penguins. We're stuff that right. fits into it, you know. <laughs> right. And, and I thought, and, and so I've said my thing, and I'll, and I'll let them go do their thing. And, um, I, and particularly, I didn't know that Andy said constraints are good. I assume constraints were awful and that creative types really didn't like them. So I got out of the way. But I think I should have stayed in the process, even though it was uncomfortable for me, um, and tried to nudge them along. Because as you can see, we had to go in and do the framing, in most cases, at the end of the video with just text. And I think if I had stayed involved, it could have been woven more tightly into the narrative, which is really important uh, when you're trying to get people to enjoy the message, but also kind of internalize the message. So I would maybe be a little more heavy-handed as they would let me be the next time. And I also learned that it's much more fun to sit in meetings with creative folks at the end of the day um, than sit in faculty meetings. <laughs>